Okay, so today I'm going to talk about concepts in sequence alignment. And then next week I'm going to talk about using sequence alignment concepts to search databases of sequences. So they go together pretty smoothly. Um, the, the concepts that I want to cover today, um, identity, similarity, and homology, um, how to understand the differences and not misuse those terms in your own language. Um, I'm going to go over dot plots in pretty good detail. Um, so you could imagine that I might have some homeworks and exam questions involved with that. Uh, alignments of text strings by edit distance, scoring of alignments, amino acids and DNA, what gap penalties mean, um, the definition of global versus local alignment. I'm going to show the dynamic programming algorithm, which is usually called Smith-Waterman, and a little bit on Fast Day. And then next week, I'm going to spend most of the time on BLAST and using BLAST in your work. Okay, so to start with, I mean, why is it important to compare sequences? Um, frequently, the output of a laboratory, <clears throat> laboratory experiment is some sort of sequence data. DNA, uh, occasionally protein if you're doing proteomics. And very often you want to ask a very basic question. What is this thing that I just found when my output is some sort of a DNA sequence? So you might want to compare new genes to ones that are already known compare genes from different species. You might be involved in some sort of evolutionary analysis. Um, sequence alignment and comparison can also be used to predict or guess the function of an entire genome full of new sequences, which is becoming an increasingly common thing that we do. Um, also, sequence alignments are used to make sense of next-gen sequencing to map individual sequence reads to a known genome to look for things like mutations or pr DNA protein interactions or a whole bunch of other things. So sequence alignment is like a very, very fundamental concept that's used throughout genomics and molecular biology. So when we ask the simplest question, are there other sequences like this one? It requires that we have some sort of a database of sequences to look things up. Something like GenBank, which is very comprehensive, or SwissPro, which is very well annotated, giving us information about sequences. Um, as a quote from, from Bob Pearson, sequence comparison is the most powerful and reliable method to determine evolutionary relationships between genes. So it's been very revolutionary for the whole world of taxonomy to have access to sequence information on the species that are being studied and trying to categorize them hierarchically or whatever. So when we talk about similarity searching, we mean that we're based on alignment. You can't really make a statement about how sequences are similar to each other until you align them and then make some measure of how well they align, and that is your similarity measurement. Um, BLAST and FASTA are two different sequence alignment tools that provide more rapid similarity searching rather than the more structural methods of sort of sliding the sequences and counting the similarities. They are rapid, but they're also approximate. Uh, we use the word heuristic, which is a sort of computational shortcut for an algorithm that finds an approximate solution but does not always find the optimal solution, which means you can get false positive and negative scores. So as we, evaluate, as we dig deeper into how these methods work, you have to keep in mind their strengths and weaknesses and why you might want to use one method over another or how you might need to compensate for the particular weakness of the method that you're using. Um, important language tip. Um, frequently you hear people use the word homologous genes. 
Um, the word homology is an evolutionary statement, which means descent from a common ancestor. So just because two sequences have similarities in their sequence does not absolutely mean that they are homologous. And since descent from a common ancestor is essentially a factual statement, it doesn't involve percentages. It's not like you're 25% homologous. Either you do, these two sequences do have a common ancestor and they've evolved by a series of mutational events, or they don't and their similarities are by chance. So you, homology is a yes or no statement, whereas percent identity obviously can be quantitative. However, high percent identity is one piece of evidence that we would use to infer homology. Um, homology also implies a common three-dimensional structure, usually a common or closely related function. Okay, all or nothing. I like to think about similarity in terms of a dot plot. So even if you're using some completely different computational method, it's a helpful visualization tool to say what are the regions or the letters that match between these two sequences. So this is what I mean when I talk about a dot plot. So there's two axes, a vertical and a horizontal. And in this plot, I'm simply putting a dot wherever the, the vertical and horizontal sequence have the same letter, right? G and G, T and T, and other T and T, et cetera. So you put a dot wherever there's a match. A diagonal line, which is not immediately obvious in this plot, um, would indicate a region of high identity possible homology. Um, frequently, it's helpful to interpret a dot plot by applying a windowing filter to look at a group of bases together rather than just plot each one by one. So uh, in this, well, this plot, I've made a four base window with a 75% identity filter and all the noise has dropped out and now you see that GATC matches GTTC so we put a dot here and ATCA matches TTCA so we put a dot here etc but I don't find other four window uh, four base 75 percent identity regions now that's a pretty strict filter and these are fake sequences so you'll always get you know, somewhat more noise in a realistic alignment scenario. But when you have regions of identity and an appropriately sized filter, then you'll see diagonal lines. If the diagonal lines are broken like this, that means that there's an insertion in one sequence relative to the other, and then the uh, homology continues. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So th this one? So I'm just sli taking a window of three bases, of four bases, and a window of four bases here, and then I'm saying if these four are this are 75 percent the same, then I'm going to put a g a, a dot under the g. So that dot represents the whole window. That's just a convention for how we do the windows. You have to put the dot somewhere, and it works out better to put it at the first letter of the sliding window rather than, say, in the center. All right, so frequently we use uh, windows that have much lower percent identity, particularly with protein alignments. So 30% uh, identity is actually a relatively high amount of identity uh, between two proteins in a window of size 8 or 10 or thereabouts. 25% is kind of like the cutoff that is often used for finding reasonable amount of identity between two proteins that are 
inferred or hypothetically homologous. And often you get um, many lines. This would be the case for a sequence that's somewhat repeated. And so there's, you could shift the sequence over by a certain amount and those repeats will still show alignments. So when you see these many parallel diagonals, that's a, a sure sign that your sequence contains repeated regions. So in fact, the, the skill of reading dot plots, which isn't so common anymore, used to be a, a major informatics uh, well, it used to be something that people who did bioinformatics spent a lot of time at. It was almost like reading x-rays, you know, that you could infer a whole lot of information from the pattern of dots and diagonals, and you might go in and add, try a few different window stringencies to enhance a particular feature that you wanted to emphasize when you paste that figure into your publication. You don't see dot plots so much anymore, but the concept still underlies alignment tools that we do use. All right, so here's a case where we're matching, oops, hemoglobin with myoglobin, and there's really strong uh, single diagonal window 8, stringency 10, so that's more than 50% homology or identity, more than 50% identity. This is a really much lower amount of similarity. Okay, so I showed you dot plots, but that's not the way that you would present an alignment. Usually you would want to show the actual letters of two sequences in some frame indicating which letters match. Yeah. Well, the stringency is pretty low here. But it's the same two sequences. I've just um, made the window smaller and the stringency higher to filter out the noise. Bigger windows, you could, by chance, find some group of bases that, that match. That means you're going to have more chances to get hits, right? Yes. So if you're looking for very distant homologies, you might use a bigger window and a lower stringency. As you're working with sequences that are more similar to each other, a smaller window and a higher stringency will give you a cleaner uh, looking alignment. But the, uh, the, there's only one point difference between the, the previous one and the next one. Uh, but you see the huge difference. I assume that's because of the window size. But, uh, mm -hmm. More, more noise. Okay, so it's just a, you know, example. These are the same plot with two different window sizes, basically. Okay, so I'm going to talk now about working with. Yeah. Stringency is the percent of the number of letters in the window that match. Very, very low. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to talk about strings for a little while. Um, if you think about just having two sequences in, uh, of text and you have them showing up on your screen, you could align them by just using your space bar, right? Start with overlapping no bases and then the slide the lower one along, overlap one, two, three, four, and then out the other side. And for every one of those frames of alignment, you could count the number of letters that match. Obviously, when they're overlapping each other more, you have more chances for matching. When you have a lot of gaps, there's fewer. Um, in addition, you can use the space bar to insert gaps inside of either the sequence on the bottom or the sequence on the top to force an alignment. If you think about it for a while, since DNA has only a four-letter alphabet, if you didn't have any cost for inserting the gaps, you could force two sequences into a frame of alignment that was pretty good just by freely sprinkling gaps all over the place. So we're, when we come up with a way of scoring those alignments, we're going to have to 
put, add some sort of a penalty for inserting gaps inside of the sequence. So in this case, we could just use as a measure of identity the percent sequence identity. How many of the letters compared to the total length of the sequences are matching? In this case, we have a couple of mismatches and the rest of the letters match. We also have a couple of uh, gaps inserted in the sequence. So we're, in this case, we're counting a gap as, the same, as a one mismatch because we're having an A aligned to a gap. So these two sequences come out as 70% identical. Um, there's the definition for this, or, or at least this type of measurement, percent identity, is called a Hamming distance, which is the minimum number of base changes that will convert one ungapped sequence into the other. So this is uh, mismatches with no gaps allowed. And then for every mismatch, uh, changing one of the bases would convert that sequence into the other one. And it doesn't matter which sequence you, you switch, obviously. It's just a, a single number of changes that convert one sequence to the other. And I made a, well, I found a Python function for Hamming distance. This is not something I'm going to give you to work. But if you like that sort of thing, there it is. This Hamming distance is named after Richard Hamming, who introduced it in his fundamental paper on Hamming codes. Um, we end up using this, yes? Well, in Hamming distance, there's no gaps allowed. In the next slide, we'll get to adding gaps. Um, but we do use Hamming distance in making DNA barcodes, which is something that's still actually used quite a lot. For example, when you're labeling sequences, uh, when you're going to batch them together for sequencing, you, you add an 8 or a 12 base barcode. And the idea is that if you miscall one of those bases in sequencing, then that's a Hamming distance of 1, right? Instead of getting an A, you get a different letter at that position. And so what we try and do is design a group of barcodes so that no single change of letter will convert one, one barcode to another. It requires a minimum Hamming distance of two. So these older concepts, in this case from 1950, although this wasn't designed for biology, this Hamming distances were, were designed for like Morse code type bits that would travel over the internet or whatever they had in 1950. <laughs> but the same concept applies to DNA codes as it does to Morse codes, a single letter change. So the Hamming distance can be unrealistic because if you have a gap, it shifts everything off. And now you know none of the letters match. So Levenstein introduced something called edit distance, which adds the concept of a gap as a distance of one in the same way that having a base change uh, is a distance. Um, Illumina sequencing doesn't really insert much in the way of gaps, but there's other methods that do, in which case you could in fact get an indel inside the barcode. So that's not something that we use right now, but the same thing applies. So one, adding one, ba one mismatch penalty for a gap isn't sufficient to model what goes on biologically. Because you may often see in real sequences gaps that are larger than one base. Um, you see single base gaps more often as sequencing errors, less often in real sequences, but when you do see a gap, it's not always just one base. The same biological event can insert a multi-base gap. And, and then rather than have the same penalty added for each additional base, um, 
people have invented something called an affine gap penalty, which basically means that there's a high penalty for inserting a, a single new gap, but every additional base that you add to that gap is penalized at a much smaller rate, so that a big gap is not much more of a penalty than a small gap. And it's particularly important in, um, well, in a, when you're running an alignment algorithm, because alignment algorithms are stupid and they try and generate an optimal score. And you would much rather have a two base gap here rather than have two single base gaps here and here. And with the affine gap penalty, this will have a, a better overall alignment score than this will because this involves two separate biological events and, and this involves just one. Um, this becomes even more important when you get into multiple alignments because you have to make many similar decisions over and over again about the same region and you don't want to be scattering lots of gaps all over the place in order to make many sequences align. You'd rather have fewer larger gaps. So with unlimited gaps, no penalties, unrelated sequences can align, especially if they're DNA sequences because eventually after some number of gaps, every letter is going to come, uh, is going to line up underneath uh, uh, the same letter in the other sequence. And in fact, the gap should be much more costly than a mismatch. You, you'd really prefer to allow a mismatch over a gap because biologically that's much more likely to happen, one base converting to another as opposed to an insertion deletion event which happens much more rarely. Um, a multi-base gap should cost only a little bit more and it, you should have an additional penalty for adding a second gap near a first gap, that should be strongly disfavored by your algorithm, if at all possible, because again, that biologically that's less likely to happen. Two separate insertion deletion events separated by only a few bases. You should mush them together and allow for a mismatch and two next to each other gaps is preferred over gap, base, 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 gap. All right, so this is the little formula for the Hamming distance. So P is the gap open penalty, and sigma is the gap extend penalty, and then X is the number of additional spaces of gap that you're inserting. The, the reason I'm putting it in a formulaic sort of way is because these are typically parameters that you're allowed to adjust in your alignment tool. Even BLAST on the NCBI website has a place where you can change the gap penalty. And this is what you're doing. And, and again, there's generally two different gap penalties that you can adjust. The gap open penalty and the gap extend penalty. And this is how they fit into the formula. Okay, another important concept is global versus local alignments. So a global similarity or a global alignment uses the complete sequences and it computes the total percent of matches. Um, in, this is usually known as the Needleman-Wunsch algorithm. They, they wrote this as a piece of software, I guess in the 60s. Alternately, a local similarity looks for the best internally matching region between two sequences and it ignores tails of one sequence or the other or both that don't match. You simply score the best internal matching region. Um, and, it and this is essentially the same as finding a diagonal region on the dot plot and not worrying if the diagonal falls somewhere in the middle of the graph and you have portions of the plot that don't align. You simply score the diagonal and the two sequences that have the best diagonal, those are the ones that have the best alignment score. So the Smith-Waterman algorithm is sort of an improvement on the Needleman-Wunsch that focuses on local alignment. Um, 
both BLAST and FASTA are heuristic tools that use local alignments. Um, I'm going to show you a dynamic programming algorithm, which is essentially the basis of Smith-Waterman for how this is calculated. But just conceptually or in a cartoon form, a global alignment means that you have to align the two full sequences from the very beginning of one uh, starts at the very beginning of the other and then you you count aligned bases gaps mismatches etc you're allowed to slide them along each other but the unmatched regions are, are penalized whereas a local alignment asks the question is there an internal region of the first sequence that matches an internal region of the second sequence. And you try and maximize that internal region, but once you've reached the end and adding more bases doesn't improve the alignment, you can stop and say, this is the optimal local alignment for these two sequences. And the tail ends, the unmatched regions are not penalized. This is obviously important if your two sequences are of different lengths. The longer one is always going to have a tail that's not matching the shorter one. But also it's more realistic in a biological context where, you know, gene regions are going to match each other and flanking regions are not, or two proteins might share uh, a highly conserved region but have three prime and five prime regions that are more diverged. And so most biological alignments are done using a local alignment method. And in fact, BLAST means basic local alignment method or basic, basic local alignment search tool. So in a global alignment, you'd be forcing these two sequences to have a lot of gaps, whereas a local alignment would find this internal region of high similarity. Extreme case, but this is the concept that I'm after. So the Smith-Waterman method, which is dynamic programming, uh, is essentially a, system, a way of systemizing scoring of a dot plot. It's a way of finding those diagonals and, and scoring them, but it, it uses uh, alignment path matrix, a way of calculating things that will always find the best solution. Um, it's a stepwise process, similar to a heuristic, but not exactly the same as a heuristic. Or not, I mean, not exactly the same. Never mind. It's a heuristic. It's, it's not a heuristic. It's an optimal method. Um, and it uses a backtracking. So after all the alignment scores have been calculated, then it comes back and finds the optimal one. So what we're going to do is we're going to fill in this big box with scores for every position. And those scores are going to be cumulative. So we're going to start in the corner and then each new box is going to inherit a score from the, the previous set of boxes. So you build the optimal alignment using previous solutions of smaller subsequences. So you start by aligning the first two bases, and then you, you, you come into the second one in one sequence and the second one in the other, always asking, is it better to allow for a mismatch or a gap in one or a gap in the other? So the F is the score which is indexed by I and J. So I would be moving across the first sequence horizontally and J is moving across the second sequence vertically. So F of I, J is the score of the best alignment that's possible at a given position. So frequently you can arrive at a given position through a few different paths. You could gap one sequence or the other one, allow a mismatch. And f of ij is always the optimal. So you actually have to make decisions for every box that you fill in. And it is so a recursive algorithm. Okay, so when we score 
a one here that's aligning this A with a gap. So this, this matrix is, is going to use a very simple scoring system where um, mismatches and gaps both get a score of one. And what we're trying to do is minimize the number of these penalty scores that we accumulate as we move through the matrix. So no scores here because we're not aligning anything, but A is now aligned with a gap in the other sequence here. And if we just gap all the way down, meaning we slide one sequence all the way past the other, then we get a maximum score of eight, which is eight gaps or eight mismatches either way. So obviously we can do better than that. And similarly, if we slide along this way, adding a gap at every position, then we're going to get a maximal score of eight. But because this A matches this A, there's no penalty for moving diagonally and putting a zero here. So that zero is similar to putting a dot in the dot plot. Oops. So if we know the score diagonally to the left, above, and directly to the left, we can choose which one of those to use when we calculate the score in the, in the next box. So there's, there's three possibilities for each box that we move diagonally and uh, allow an alignment score between two letters. In other words, they're either the same or not the same, and so we're going to add a 0 or a 1 there. Or we move down and gap vertically, and that would obviously get a mismatch score of 1. Or we move horizontally, and we, add a mis we get a mismatch score of 1. In each case, that score is added to the score of the box that's to the left or above or diagonal. So the best score for this box here is the minimum of the three options. So either we're going to slide across um, in this alignment between uh, A and C. So already we've aligned A with A, and then we've gapped across. Or we've aligned A with A, and then we've aligned C with A. Either way, there's going to be a mismatch of one there. And then we're going to say, OK, now we're going to slide across, or we're going to take that AC alignment and then match. Or we're going to take two gaps here and align this A with this A. And that'll take the same score of two. So the best score we can get here, either aligning this A and then two gaps, or this A aligning with this A and sliding down diagonally and adding nothing you're still going to get two for this box. So the, the smallest score you can put in this box is a two. And then you move across and you move. Another way you could fill the box is just going down diagonally. So from here, your A with A is a zero. And then your next box to fill would be this one. Well, G with C is going to be a mismatch. So this would force us to have a one here. Yeah. Um, it's the minimum score. So you could have aligned this A with this A and then, align, and then put a gap, or you could have gapped over. You could have aligned this A with this A and then gapped over once. So there's a couple ways to get the one there. So one of the things you could do is just fill diagonally. Um, and so it works out that this A matches this A, but this G does not match this C. And then you have to carry this one down diagonally, while this C does not match this A, so you add another one. But this A does match this A, so you don't have to add another one there. This C does match this C, so you don't have to add another one there. This A does not match this T, so you add a third one there. And then this C, oops, 
doesn't match this A. And so, hmm, I should have had a fourth one there. I don't know. I copied this slide from Michael Schatz, so I thought it was right because he's smarter than me. <laughs> but I think he may have copied it from somebody else. <laughs> but the idea is this, this is the same. So when you go across, you add one. When you go down, you add one. When you go diagonal, you either add one for a mismatch or add none because they're the same. In fact, you could do the whole thing the other way around and add add one for positive matches and subtract one for mismatches and gaps. And then you'd be trying to maximize the score rather than minimize the score. It ends up being exactly the same. I think it's easier to understand when you add up the penalties and you say this is the minimum number of mismatches that you can have sliding through this entire matrix. Once you've calculated the score for every box, then you can go back and sort of retrace the minimum path and say, OK, you know, my minimum path goes up this diagonal, and then there's either a mismatch or a gap here. And that's, it, it turns out in this matrix, there's a number of different paths that are equivalent to each other. There's a bunch of ways to get down here to two and a bunch of places where you could go either inserting a gap or here or there. So this is a relatively simple sequence to optimize. And in many cases, there are actually several equivalent alignments. So even though it's optimal, it may not be a unique solution to the problem. Mm-hmm. On the line? I, I don't get what you mean. The, the numbers are in the boxes, right? You're just saying the numbers that are underlined. Oh, the underlined. Oh, that's the one that's being shown down here. Okay. So that's how we get this path, right? We, um, we align A with A, but then we jump downward. And that indicates a gap in this sequence. So this is one of the optimal alignments that brings you um, it, it's aesthetically pleasing because it brings you all the way to the end rather than having an overhang, which these other two alignments have. So it's the one he's chosen to illustrate. Yeah, so the underlines are this path. And this is just showing you how retracing your steps through the matrix. We've moved sideways here. Sometimes you illustrate this by showing arrows that connect these guys. This sideways move is equivalent to this gap here, right? And this downward move here is equivalent to this gap down here. So then the number two in that equation, the D bracket equals two, that means the number of gaps. That, that, that's the alignment score. It's not just the number of gaps. It's the total number of gaps or mismatches. In this case, we've chosen two gaps and no mismatches. If we had changed the gap penalty so that moving down, say, cost two, whereas allowing a mismatch only cost one, we would have found a different optimal alignment. So that's one of the messages, the take home messages, is your choice of penalties will give you different alignments. And so even though we can say we've calculated an optimal alignment for two sequences, that is an optimal alignment for a particular set of gap and mismatch penalties. Um, and so it, in some sense, it's a little bit arbitrary. What most people end up doing is they choose the default gap and alignment penalties that are available for a particular tool. And sometimes those are good, and sometimes they're not good for the particular problem you're trying to solve. And so a more sophisticated user might say, well, because of the nature of these sequences, I have chosen these specific set of match, mismatch, and gap penalties, um, which you know, reflect the biological relationship I'm trying to illustrate with this alignment.
So that's a more sophisticated approach. Um, in a tool like BLAST, the tools have the, uh, the defaults have been chosen sort of iteratively with a lot of user feedback, and they often produce a good result for the average search. But your search may not be average. You may be working with sequences that are either more similar or less similar than the, the way the tool is calibrated by default. And you have the option to change these things. Um, Smith-Waterman is optimal, again, for a given set of penalties. But it's computationally slow because before you can find this alignment, you have to fill in every single box. There isn't really a, a shortcut to it because in advance, you don't necessarily know where the diagonals are going to show up, you know, where you're going to get this row of ones. So, and, and as you can imagine, since it's a, it's the box is square, the number of cells that you have to compute increases with the product of the length of the two sequences. And so it grows quickly as your sequences get longer. And Smith-Waterman becomes computationally expensive for long sequences or if you have to take one sequence and compare it to many others. Because for every comparison, you have to make the whole box, find the optimal path, score the optimal path, and then compare that to the score for every other sequence. So not practical for very large space, searching very large spaces. Yeah, and it requires computing the matrix of scores for every possible alignment position with every possible combination of gaps. So that's like when you're using the space bar, you put every possible number of spaces between every two letters and count that score, you know, not using any common sense whatsoever. So the output of a Smith-Waterman alignment is some sort of similarity score, such as this number two down here, as well as the graphical representation of the alignment showing matching letters and the, the locations of gaps. Um, when, we, uh, when we're going diagonally, we're comparing two letters. And we usually score that in a DNA matrix as identical or not identical. It's kind of a 1-0 type of a score. Uh, and then we have various kinds of modified gap scores. You could score the gap as two. You could have an affine score. So if you have two gaps in a row, it's a little smaller than if you had two separate gaps. However, when we do this kind of alignment with proteins, we have a whole different range of similarities, right? There's a two different 20-letter alphabets. And it turns out that there's a lot more possible information that we could incorporate rather than just scoring the amino acids as same or different. For example, we could use the codon table and say, that this amino acid has a certain number of mutations that would allow it to convert to this other amino acid. And so we could have a 1, 2, or 3 as the score for uh, the possible mismatches. Um, we could use some index of chemical similarity, right? They're both positively charged. They're both hydrophobic. They both have large side chains, or they don't. One has a large side chain and is positively charged. The other one has a small side chain and it's hydrophilic. So we could have some sort of indexing system based on chemical properties. Or we could look at actual data, real uh, changes that happen in homologous proteins in related species. And that turns out to be the most powerful method of all. But each one of these methods has been attempted and software tools have been produced that use each one of these different types of scoring systems. But I'm going to show you something called the PAM matrix, which, oh, yeah, it's calculated from observed mutations. So, this is just thinking about chemistry, right? 
So we have positive charges, negative charges, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, circular side chains, and small side chains. And so these are families, and you could say that a change within a family is worth you know, smaller penalty score than a change that moves across different families of amino acids. And somebody's written up this little thing to show the nature of those relationships. It turns out to be kind of a pain to encode this as a matrix of scores, but people have done it. Um, but it's much more interesting to look at evolutionary conservation. So if we just think about a group of proteins that are definitely related by descent from a common ancestor and and you know we're, we're completely sure about that these are all the GSTM proteins they align really nicely but in fact there are certain positions where there are amino acid changes and other positions where there are no changes which indicates to me a very high conservation for functional reasons, right? This is some kind of an active domain and randomly changing the amino acids here is not tolerated very well in terms of maintaining protein function. So the changes that do occur are what you could call allowed mutations, ones that don't change the amino acid uh, properties very much, don't change the shape of the protein very much, and don't interfere with protein function. And so you could just make a substitution matrix for how often in these aligned regions a given amino acid is substituted one for another. And so what you'll see is stuff like isoleucine swaps for leucine and valine really often doesn't seem to be constrained much at all, almost as often as you would expect by chance. Whereas some of the other ones, like these ones with the, the huge side chains, phenylalanine, tyrosine, or arginine, don't swap for something small like serine or alanine very often at all. So those mutations are not accepted or tolerated in, say, a, a protein active site. And this can be calculated. It was done by Margaret Dayhoff in, in 1978 using, obviously, a much smaller set of proteins than we have available to us now. But it turns out that she was really onto something, and this matrix still works extremely well right now. It's called the PAM matrix, which is percent accepted mutations. And she had, you know, a few, well, a few dozen families with a few hundred proteins or a few dozen proteins in each family. And she just calculated the frequency within those aligned regions that one amino acid is replaced by another, and then just normalized the whole thing. And then multiplied that matrix by itself a number of times. And so this is the PAM 250. So this is multiplying that matrix of frequencies by itself 250 times, which seems to be sort of in the middle of what you would see among two distantly related but still obviously homologous protein sequences. And, and this matrix works really well. And so instead of scoring plus one or zero when you move diagonally through the Smith-Waterman, all you do is you look at the mismatch in this table and you insert that number. Also worth noticing in this table is that the diagonal is not composed of all ones or all tens or the same number. So that the same base aligned with itself does not always get the same score. Why is that? Well, the overall database of protein sequences is not equally composed of all the amino acids. Some occur more frequently than others. Alanine turns out to be really frequent. <laughs> and therefore, if you have one alanine aligned with another in two different 
proteins, it's worth less than if you have a phenylalanine aligned with each other because that one is extremely rare and that alignment is very unlikely to have occurred by chance and it's very unlikely that you would swap out another amino acid to replace a phenylalanine and maintain the same protein structure. So that's not a, a so you give this a really high score when you see two of those guys align with each other. And a really low score when this guy aligns with anything else. So more recently, uh, another matrix was calculated called Blossom. Same methodology, but using much larger, more modern collection of proteins. And in this case, they didn't align the entire protein the way Dayhoff did. They only align the block of most conserved sequence. So you're chopping out the portion of a group of proteins that aligns with each other, not considering the tail ends that align less well. So it's more like active sites or conserved domains. And then what they've done is they, instead of multiplying the matrix by itself, they've chosen different blocks to represent different amounts of similarity. So this block has an average percent identity of 60%, and so you know that's the Blossom 60. Simple as that. Blossom 90, you have proteins that align at 90% identity. Um, the BLAST uses a default, I think, of Blossom 62. Yeah, Blossom 62, general use, which again is sort of the average amount of distance that people tend to use with a BLAST search when they want to find similarity. If you know you're looking for similarities that are much closer, you might use a higher Blossom matrix. If you're looking for similarities more distant, you would use a lower Blossom matrix. Uh, the PAM is reversed numerically so that lower PAM number represents higher similarity. Higher PAM number represents lower similarity. Um, you would think that the Blossom would work much better because the, they put a lot more effort into building those matrices, but I see them as working almost exactly the same. So. The, the property that Dayhoff calculated was extremely well estimated using the data that she had available. This conservation of amino acids. It's a relatively strong concept. Yeah? What were the parameters for choosing those, those protein families? Like, how did they define protein families? Just back of the envelope. They just used their personal expertise to say this group of proteins have the same enzymatic function. They're sufficiently similar and uh, have the same role in these different species. Or it's a multi-gene family. And again, we can identify by eye that these are members of a multi-gene family. So that because they were building the rules for doing the alignment, they had to start with existing biological knowledge. But they got it right. They understood the proteins they were working with. They confined themselves to working with proteins that they knew a lot about. Very often they used the same exact gene in a group of related species. Okay, so I've told you now that there's a lot more information available when you do an alignment between two protein sequences because both the matching and the mismatching letters can be scored using one of these scoring matrices. Um, therefore, whenever possible, you want to do alignments and similarity searches using proteins rather than DNA sequences. Just intuitively, the fact that you have a 20-letter alphabet rather than a four-letter alphabet means that your frequency of random matches is much lower. So the difference between a real alignment and a, a fake alignment or a false positive is, is going to be greater. Um, 
Yeah, so there's less chance similarities between proteins than there are between DNA sequences. Um, also, there's um, some convergent evolutionary pressures on DNA sequences. They all have to have roughly the same GC content. Um, they may be repeat sequences and other sort of genomic constraints on DNA sequences that are much less prevalent on proteins that are sort of free to have whatever sequence they want to have that gives them optimal functionality. You can have varying degrees of similarity between amino acids, I said that. And also, you're searching smaller databases. There's a many fewer annotated protein sequences than there are DNA sequences. So if you have a completely unknown protein and you compare it to the database, your background of false positives is going to be lower because you're searching a smaller search space, whereas the database of DNA sequences are, are very large. OK, I'm going to talk about one particular algorithm. It's more of historical and sort of how these things are built interest than it is uh, highly practical and used today. Um, but FASTA is a fast method to find alignments. That's the name, fast aligner. And it's capable of searching many sequences, such as an entire database, in a way that Smith Waterman is not, because Smith Waterman has much higher computational load. Um, one of the improvements of FASTA is it only searches near the diagonal in the dot plot. It doesn't have to compute every possible alignment all the way out to the edges of the matrix, which are unlikely to have interesting alignments in them. And it also produces a statistic. Smith-Waterman does not produce a statistic. It only produces a score. You don't know whether that score is meaningful or not. You don't know how that alignment score relates to randomness, whether the alignment score you found is better than just some random shuffling of letters that happen to align. So FASTA answers these three problems, speed, and scoring and database searching. So the fundamental concept of FASTA is derived from the logic of the dot plot, but the way it searches for a diagonal is called a word-based method. In computer science, it will be called hashing. So it takes a sequence and it chops it into small subsequences that we call words. Um, Sometimes we call them k-mers in other contexts. Um, and then it compares the words in your query sequence against the words in a target sequence. And you can think of this as just one-on-one. -on -one. So you have, instead of a dot plot of all of the letters, you're now looking at a window, which is a word, and you're looking for exact matches of several letters between your query sequence and your target sequence. So you could think of that as putting a dot on the dot plot where three or four or five letters match exactly between the two sequences. It only matches identical words. So this is kind of a weakness of the algorithm, but it turns out that computationally, it speeds things up a great deal to only look for perfect matches between two tables of words because that's what a hash algorithm does. It says, is this word present in this other column of words? Um, when you do DNA, usually you set the word size to six. This is an adjustable parameter, but most people would leave this at the default because all the other parameters are tuned to this one. Um, protein words can be one or two amino acids, so very small compared to a DNA word. Um, and again, it only runs the full algorithm in the location where words match, which you could think of as a small diagonal on the dot plot. 
In addition, and I've mentioned this before, in the process of creating this software, uh, Pearson also defined the FASTA format. I've shown this before, but you know, there's a header line and then there's the sequence. So I'm showing another dot plot. In this case, you could imagine that the word size is six and the percent identity is 100%. So we're only putting a dot where a six letter word matches exactly between sequence A and sequence B. And immediately you can see that there are some pretty promising looking diagonals and also a little bit of noise. Um, if you are working with amino acids rather than with, pro with DNA sequences, you have the benefit that you could rescore those alignments rather than as identical. Now you can reuse the PAM matrix and uh, get higher scores for those alignments that have highly conserved PAM scores keeping the top segments and throwing away at this point those diagonals which are below some threshold score. After all the good diagonals are found, then it tries to add gaps. So initially the diagonals are, join, are drawn only using identical words, which means no gaps. But then it tries to it join them up by adding some gaps. And then it computes an alignment using the Smith-Waterman method, but only between the dotted lines, only that portion of the whole matrix that includes this joined diagonal line. So, and in fact, if you don't have a joined diagonal line that meets some minimum threshold, you don't even bother with the Smith-Waterman. You just move on to the next sequence. Or if you have two sequences, then you would compute it anyway and you'd generate a poor score, statistically not very significant. The output is usually displayed like this, where you have a, uh, a z-score, which is basically just something that's computed the number of matches minus the gap penalty. Then you have a, a percent identity, total number of bases that are in the aligned region. Again, you're not necessarily aligning the whole sequence. It's a local alignment. And so uh, ends that don't align are not going to be shown in this, re in this diagram. And then you also have a score, which is a statistical value, an E value. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how that's computed. Oh shoot, I guess I'm going to talk about it later. I ran out, I, I cut this lecture shorter than I wanted. You know what, I want to get into that, so I'm going to grab the slides from next time and talk just about the E-value score, hopefully, if I have it here. I will add these slides into today's lecture afterwards. Okay, so this is work that was done by Pearson as well that the score, the raw score for the number of matching alignments is not 
normally distributed. In fact, it, um, there's a very large number of low scores and a small number of very high scores, which is modeled by this thing that they call the extreme value distribution. And so the statistics are based on uh, a mathematical model of the extreme value distribution. And he did, using FASTA, he uh, computed a bunch of scores for a bunch of different proteins and, and showed that they fell very, very closely on this model of the extreme value distribution. So this is a good model for how the scores occur if you just report the raw score, the number of alignments, my, number of matches, minus mismatches, minus gap penalty, something like that. Um, but we can compute an E value from the extreme value distribution where E is the significance score, M is the length of the query, N is the total size, oh, is the length of the matching database sequence, S is the score, the raw score from the matches and mismatches and gap penalties, and K is based on the size of the database, which is some estimate of, of false positives, right? The larger the database grows, the more likely you are to get a random match, uh, especially if the sequences aren't too big. But in any case, your, your overall score is a function of the size of the database that you're searching. You keep searching a bunch of different sequences, the scores are going to be higher and lower in some random fashion. The more sequences you search, the, the more chance there is to find a high score. And then lambda is a constant that models the extreme value distribution. And so negative lambda times s, e to this power. So this is, this is a an expression that involves the distribution and the score. And then these are basically constants, right? The length of the two sequences and the size of the database. K is database. Well, not constants, but these are simple variables. Then you're just multiplying by e to the negative lambda s. So what this is telling you is that this e value is the probability that the match you have is better than a match that you find by chance. The smaller that number, the more statistically significant your probability of match is interesting rather than random. So an E value of one means that you are likely to get one match from a database of this size with a random sequence of the size that you just searched. So that's a completely insignificant result. Typically in biology, we use an E value cutoff of 0.05, which in terms of making database searches is, um, depends on what you're looking for. Um, it may well be that since biological sequences are not randomly distributed that an E value match of 0.05 could be related to noise or uh, skewed composition of a particular sequence that happens to match some other things in the database that share that composition or it might be a real match and it might be even that if you're searching for very distant similarities you know between bacteria and mammals something like that that the E value might be lower and still biologically meaningful. And so it gives you a statistic, but it's not a very hard and fast rule that you can only consider E values better than this. And in fact, very frequently you want to make, be more stringent than this. Okay, so that was the E values. The rest of the lecture on BLAST I'm going to do on uh, Thursday, and I'm going to give a homework that covers this and that on Thursday. Um, 
the tutors will be ready at four upstairs if you have problems with the homework from the last lecture. All right.